May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be ever mindful of thee, O Lord, my strength and my salvation. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? <coughs> While we were singing that last hymn, Come Labor On, I had what I would call a petite Madeleine moment. What are you talking about? There's a book that I read when I was a young man called Swan's Way. It's part, part of a series by a man named Proust, Remembrance of Things Past. And the story opens up with uh, the character going to a little French village, and he's offered a little cookie. It's called a Petite Madeleine. And as he's eating the cookie, all of a sudden, the memory memories are awoken. He's transported to another place, another time in his mind. And I have to tell you that how him did it to me. Because once again, I was eight years old, attending a boys' school of 800 boys, no girls, sitting in chapel and choir every morning as we sang hymns like that. It was really powerful. And it took me back in so many different ways. And it actually is going to infect what I'm going to talk to you about today. Because I want to talk to you about Thanksgiving. I want to talk to you about disposable women. I want to talk to you about... <laughs> What's so funny? I have a great joke. <laughs> disposable women? Well, that's what Hannah was. But well, we'll get there. But I want to talk to you about character and courage and perseverance in the face of everything going in your life. We're going to celebrate Thanksgiving, the most popular, along with the 4th of July, of our secular holidays. It has a semi-religious feel to it. It's the celebration of the American religion, of Americanism. The 4th of July and Thanksgiving are those things that we all share. And it's been part of our culture ever since the pilgrims came to this land. In 1620, the pilgrims on the Mayflower left England in September and they got to Provincetown Harbor on Cape Cod in November. Anybody know what Cape Cod is like in November? <laughs> it's miserable! It's cold! And I don't even think they had a little fence up around Plymouth Rock in the $5 parking spots yet. But they arrived, and they arrived at the start of winter. The 102 people on the Mayflower quickly did dwindle to 53 that winter through starvation, disease, privation, and it was only in the spring that they began to, be, began to plant crops. And then they had a problem. They're in New England. And what is the soil in New England? Rocks. <laughs> and on Cape Cod, sand. They had left to England where you drop a pea in the ground, it grows into a tree. In England, New England, nothing grows. And they had to, and they only, and the thing that kept them from total devastation was the Indian Squanto. Squanto taught them how to farm in New England. They had to put a little fish head as fertilizer in the soil because the soil of New England is not that great. And at the end of that summer, they had a harvest festival, just like they would back in the farms in England. And that was that first Thanksgiving. We think it was probably in September. Because it was in November, they certainly weren't sitting, out, weren't sitting outside on benches. That was the first Thanksgiving. The pilgrims gave thanks for God protecting them, for God sending Squanto to them, for God allowing them to prosper in the strange, cold, wet, miserable land of Massachusetts, which is still strange, wet, and cold. <laughs> George Washington was the first president to ask Congress to authorize Thanksgiving Day. On the back of your bulletin, you'll see Washington's Thanksgiving Proclamation. Now, it's October 3rd, 1789. He penned this and set the fourth Thursday of November as the Thanksgiving Day. And what was going on in 1789? Why was Washington doing this? In other words, Politicians act. And even George Washington was a politician. The best we ever had, but still, he responds to events. What's happened? We won the revolution. 
The war is over. Denise, I'm sorry, but we won. You guys lost. <laughs> but in 1789, another revolution had broken out, this one in France. And what was happening in France was totally different than the American Revolution. In America, we were rude to each other. We were said cutting words to each other. We dumped other people's tea into Boston Harbor. In France, they're getting the guillotine out. The king is dead. The whole country is set against each other. France had this idea of a, not, of a revolution like America's, but has perverted it and destroyed it and gone off into this horrible direction. And so George Washington issued a proclamation basically saying, Thank God we all left Europe. Thank God we're Americans. Thank God for our liberty of conscience. You can believe, you cannot believe. You can do whatever you want to do. This is a free country of free people. And the only thing that's stopping you is your own uh, shortcomings. So Washington was celebrating we're not like them. We had a second presidential Thanksgiving proclamation, and that was from Franklin Roosevelt in 1939. And in 1939, Roosevelt set up Thanksgiving Day as a holiday, and in 1941, Congress made it an official federal holiday so that everybody could get off and get paid. <laughs> and it made it an annual holiday. Now, why did Franklin Roosevelt in 1939 want to have a day of Thanksgiving? Again, looking at the bigger political picture. We had just come out of the Depression. It was over by 39. The, the Hoovervilles, the bread lines, the 22% unemployment, they had gone. And in September of 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. And two weeks later, the Russians invaded Poland. People forget that the Nazis and the Communists were allies for the first three years of the Second World War. Before that, Europe basically held together because, well, at least the Nazis and the Communists will kill each other off, and then we'll be safe because they're busy murdering each other. When they signed a pact to divide up the world between them, that meant war was inevitable. And it was peop and, and people like Charles Lindbergh in the United States, the leaders of what we call the America First movement, wanted to have a holiday that basically said, thank God we're not Europeans. We're out of the Depression. We don't have communists. We don't have Nazis. We do, but they all live in Brooklyn, so we don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> thank God we are not them. And so the Thanksgiving federal holiday we have today was sort of in the model of the George Washington holiday. Thank God we've come through a terrible situation. Things are okay, but it's not as bad as Europe. <laughs> well, there's a third Thanksgiving presidential proclamation that to me is much more powerful. And that was also on an October 3rd, this time in 1863. Abraham Lincoln was approached by leaders of social and cultural leaders of the North saying, we need to have a day of thanksgiving. Now, what was happening in 1863? The Battle of Gettysburg had just taken place. The South, the Confederate armies, had gone up to the middle of Pennsylvania. Now, we, looking back upon the time, say, well, that was the high water mark. They didn't know that then. They didn't know that they would win the war. They didn't know Sherman's march to the sea would destroy the South, or that Grant would conquer the West. They thought the consensus, the smart people, General McClellan in Washington was saying to Lincoln, this is going to be a war of attrition that's going to last for years, and we're probably best in having a negotiated settlement. America was at its nadir. It couldn't get worse. And Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation, and what he did was to say, okay, things are pretty bad right now. Our nation is brother against brother. It's destroying itself. Yet, let's look at the positive things that are going on nonetheless. The forests are being cleared. The frontiers are moving farther west. 
business and industry and lives are taking place outside of a war zone. Peace and prosperity and rule of law reigns. Yes, America is in a terrible spot. But let's thank God for the things we have. I don't know about you, but I like the Lincoln idea of Thanksgiving much more than the Roosevelt or the Washington one. Because my life has had occasions when I feel it's not going to get any worse than I get a jury doing something. <laughs> and what we're called to do, even when life has fallen apart, when, even when everything is going against you, is to hold fast, hold on. We don't, we'll never probably understand why bad things happen in our lives. <clears throat> but we do know what we should do. Trust in Jesus. This is where, this is a terrible word, and it'll make some people blush. Character. Character counts. When we are in that point of utter and total loss and destruction, what keeps us alive and our head above water is faith in Jesus Christ, and it needs our character, our strength, to make it happen. Because there are people who know the Lord, yet go under. Let me talk about disposable women. <laughs> we have our reading from the book of Samuel. And it's the story of Hannah. Hannah was married to Elkanah, and she was a second wife. Now, Elkanah's other wife had lots of kids, and was just doing everything a wife should do. What was the value of a woman? To have children, to carry on the line. Now, this woman had sons. This woman had daughters. This woman was a full woman, culturally, socially. She was the ideal wife. And then there was Hannah, whose womb had been closed. What was Hannah's life? She basically was an unpaid servant in that house. Now her husband says, I love you anyway, babe, more than if I had ten sons. And she says, well, that really makes me feel good, thank you. <laughs> but what Hannah did not have was a sense that she was loved by God. That her life had meaning and purpose. That she was an individual, not a baby machine that wasn't doing her job. And Hannah, in her despair, went to church. And we don't have rotten priests just now. Eli sort of stepped on it. He sees Hannah praying at the doorway. And he says, oh, you old bat, you're drunk. Go away. That's, I'm not making this up. You heard Sandy read this. Eli says, woman, you're drunk because you're moving your lips and you're not saying anything and you're hanging out at church. What's wrong with you? And she says, I'm not drunk. I am just in such despair. And Eli sort of, he does what, what uh, we do in the church when we want to brush somebody off. Oh, I'll pray for you right now. <laughs> Have you ever had somebody do that to you? You open your heart to them? Oh, I'll pray for you. Bye-bye. This is what's happening to Hannah. She thinks she knows what she needs to be made a complete person, which is a son, a child. But that's not really the issue. That's what she thinks the issue is. The real issue is that she is not feeling the love and power of God, and she has allowed the world to define who she is, a disposable woman. If she can't have a baby, she's worthless. And what God is saying to you is you have a worth that is far greater than just being able to reproduce. And there's a gap that we like to skip over. So, oh, she prayed and had a baby. But what happens here is that she basically had a baby once she realized that she was a complete person without having a baby. Once she got over the fact that she was more than just an object, 
a biological vehicle for the, for, a, for the man's children. But loved by God, God then used her and gave her a son. A son who became the prophet Samuel, who began, who anointed the king Saul and David. What do we take away from this? Character counts. We may be in a place in our lives where it's not good, we can't submit it. I don't know what to do, Lord! And what our immediate objective is, ah, if I got 24 dollars, 25 more bucks in the bank, that check will clear. I won't have to worry about bouncing that check. Ah, and then if I can get through Friday, then I can pay the electric bill. Ah, and if I can do, in other words, we have these short term, if this, only this happens, if only this happens, if I only had a child, if I only had more money, if I only had a better job, if I only, if I only, and we miss the fact that God loves us and wants the best for us. Every person in this world is going to suffer. The authors of Genesis basically said from the very beginning, Adam and his sons must work and by the sweat of their brow struggle to live. have children in pain, in suffering, in childbirth. Men and women are going to suffer. Nobody gets a free ride. So we know that from the very beginning, the Bible tells us. But what counts is even though we do suffer, what do we do while we suffer? And this is where character comes in. When I'm feeling overwhelmed, I really like to pick a good fight with somebody. <laughs> I want to win something! That's my parking spot, and I'm 6'3", and weigh 275 pounds, and you're 5'2", and a little old lady. Who do you think is going to win this fight? <laughs> you see where I'm coming from? I mean, we, we want to win, basically, to give ourselves a self-esteem. And what does God tell us? Our victories, our might, our labors. It's not, we don't save ourselves. We're not justified by how smart and how brave and how good looking and how this and how that. We're justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. And He's the one reaching out in our dark moments, holding our hand, and they will. For Hannah, the dark moments of being a worthless woman, an unpaid servant who had the love slash pity of her husband, who her, his, her husband's other wife was enough, basically made fun of her. Her life was miserable. The world saw her as worthless, a disposable woman. And yet she turned to God and had faith and patience and move beyond, Lord, if only X happens, then life will be perfect. She trusted in God, and then what happens? God was there. In the United States, Abraham Lincoln trusted this country could come together after the most destructive war that we have ever known. It didn't look like the North and the South could ever possibly reconcile. It's the most bloody, most violent, most destructive conflict our country has ever known. Yet Lincoln had faith that America was in the special providence of God, and we don't know how this is going to turn out. But we're trusting in the Lord. Trust in His providence. Trust in His goodness. Hold on. Your character does count. You're going to get beaten up, hopefully not this afternoon. But you're going to go through times in your life and it feels like nothing further can go wrong. Hold fast. Trust in the Lord. Don't folk. Yes, it's important to have goals to be able to move forward in this and that. But don't put them as your spiritual goals. If only this happens, then I'll believe in God and everything will be wonderful after that. <laughs>
believe and trust in the Lord. Don't seek to understand or question why, because I frankly don't think anybody's going to give you a good enough answer. But trust Him. As Hannah trusted God. There was a medieval uh, mystic named Julian of Norwich. She was a woman. And she had a profound influence on the church in that era. And she had one particular prayer that ended, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all shall be well. All shall be well in God. Trust. 